if you are working on any kind of a kaggle competition or a problem you should prepare beforehand your pipeline for working on the competition and once you start doing that your training and your iteration will become really fast kaggle is a place where you can participate in data science competitions so you just go to kaggle.com they have a lot of competitions running and you might want to participate in a image classification challenge so there is this competition called human protein atlas image classification so here you have to classify subcellular protein patterns in human cells so this has some data you can learn about the data here so i am currently going to use the data from this competition so if you go into kernels and then you click on new kernel then you can create a jupyter notebook right here so you click on new kernel select right. notebook you will be able to create a jupyter notebook right here so this is a great way to get started on any competition or even your own data part of this kernels is data sets so you can incorporate some data sets so i have here added the human protein atlas image classification data set so let's try and see what is happening with this data so the first thing is this data is there somewhere on your system it's actually in a directory called dot dot slash input if you want to see where the data is you want to understand what files are there in a jupyter notebook you can run shell commands or terminal commands with a exclamation mark so if you start a statement with an exclamation mark the jupyter treats it as a shell command right so if you run dot dot slash input you'll actually see that you have these few things you have a sample submission dot csv you have a test folder you have a train folder and you have a train dot csv let me actually get rid of this you can even do some piping so here i'm doing an ls in the training directory and i'm calling wc which is word count to get a number the reason i'm directly using a pipe not doing ls is because there are about 100000 files so if i do ls then the kernel will probably crash or take a really long time you can pipe it to head head will show you the first few rows so as you can see you have some sort of an id and then you have underscore some sort of a color dot png maybe if you want to look at what is this underscore blue etc let's look at a particular id if we do ls go to the training folder you want to see a particular id and all the images related to it right, so you can just put star and you will see that there are four images for each id right now if you go back and read the data set description on the problem page what you essentially have is you have four images for every id each image is taken under a different kind of a filter and this is a chemical filter so you put some kind of a chemical and then you take an image and then you put a different chemical and take an image and you have four images right and using these images you have to then do some sort of analysis and do some sort of a classification so you can do all this you can run some shell commands but a much better approach is actually to use a library called pathlib right pathlib is a new addition in python 3.6 it gives you a function called path so you just wrap any string into the function called path and then you can treat it like how you treat a normal path right so my data directory is path dot dot slash input then my train directory is data directory slash train right so that makes it very intuitive and very simple so really i have a test directory data directory dot test now the advantage with this is if you are using path you can then access all the information about the directory using normal python code so for instance here i have written some very complicated python code it's a lot inside a simple string expression but it does a very simple thing i want to extract the list of all the ids in the test folder so maybe i can just start out like this i will do file name for file name in test directory okay so now when you have a path if you call iter dir i t e r b i r this will give you an iterator over the files in the directory then what i'm doing is i am just doing a list comprehension and let me just look at the first 10 values out of this so i get this is some sort of a path wrapping this entire thing let's say i just want this part the id then what i can do next is i can do file name maybe first convert it to a string i can do dot split let me split on the slash let me pick the last element and then let's see what happens now i've gotten back just the file name but i want just the id i don't want this underscore green etc so let me then do dot split again now in dot split this time i'll split on underscore because there's no other underscores and then again i'm going to pick the first element zero now i've gotten like this the ids now there's still one problem you will notice is that 
for each id there are four images so if i see the length of this the length of this will be four times the actual number of ids because each id is repeated four times so you can do a very simple trick now just call set and this will convert that into a set in a set you can only have unique entries then call list so now with the list in the set you just get a list of ids so this is pretty powerful you use parsleif then you do some basic write some basic python code and you can do a lot more processing than you normally can with just shell commands so here we can see that we have about 11000 entries in the test set you can also create sub directories so i have defined a path sub dir this is file slash submissions and all i need to do is call mkdir when you say parents equals true it will create any intermediate directories when you say exists okay equal true it will not throw an error if the directory already exists yeah so that was it mainly about working with the file system so the key takeaways are work with pathlib if you want you can see the documentation here right just search for pathlib and you'll find this yeah so that was about the file system the second thing is working with csv files now probably a lot of you already know this but most of the data that you get for machine learning competitions or machine learning tasks are is often stored in csv files let's say you have an excel you can export it as csv even for example for this particular file you have a file called train.csv so let's take a look at it so we have a list of training labels in the train.csv file so again i have a shell command here and i am passing it the label csv inside a bracket right so what this will do is this will in, this will insert the value of label csv which is the training file right so you can do a simple shell command and you can look at the input you have some id you have some target for each id you have these are the target classes right so already by looking at this you get an idea that this is a multi label classification problem right so classification problems are of two types one is a dog versus cat versus x where you have to find which class a particular item belongs to and the second is a multi label classification where you have to identify what are the different classes present in the given image so the protein classification is a multi class thing that in a certain image that or in a certain set of images that you are given you can have up to 28 classes of protein so there are 28 classes right for example this id the images have the class 16 and 0 okay so now this is fine we get an idea about the file but how do you then take it into a form that you can process it in python now you can try and write some code where you open the file with open file as f then file dot read line then dot split etc etc or you can simply use a library called pandas how many people familiar with pandas most people good that's great then i can go quickly over this at pandas you just pass it a file called uh, pass it a function called read csv okay and if there is an index column for instance here is an id right i might want to access elements directly based on their id so i can pass an index column it will all automatically identify the rest right and then i just run it and i get back this nice data frame right this nice table of information now one thing i might want to do here is uh, i see this is a string right 7120 but i am really interested in the actual classes in the image so what i might want to do is then split this out each of these into particular numbers right create maybe convert this into a list So again, with pandas, you have very nice utility functions. Let's get rid of this. Yeah. So you have very nice utility functions where all you can say is that in my target train df dot target, I want some string related operation. So I first want to split it. You on the space. So when you split it on the space, you get back. So let's say seven seven one two zero becomes the string seven, the string one, the string two, the string zero in a list. Then I want to convert them to integers right so then i call map and in a map i have to then like this some code each list has to be converted into an integer right so what you do is you map int onto the list and you apply that for every single element in the data frame every single row right so once you run this you get back a list right so any kind of any kind of data transformations that you need to do it's actually quite easy to do with pandas if you have not you should definitely check out some introductory tutorials on pandas and you will realize that a lot of the things that you have been writing using loops or just 
trying to figure out how to do are really just one, one statement with pandas. You can just search a specific question, just put pandas in front of you, up front of it, you will find a stack overflow answer. Okay. So the next thing that I want to talk about very briefly is exploratory data analysis, which is simply just looking at your data and understanding what is happening. What are the characteristics of your data? What are the classes? Is there, are some classes occurring more frequently, some of them less frequently and things like that. Okay. So from the competition page, I have picked up the names of the labels. If you go on the, if you go on the competition page in the data section, they have explained what the labels are, what, so zero represents nucleoplasm, one is nuclear membrane, et cetera, et cetera. So I've just put these in a list. Okay. Now I'm going to run some analysis on my data frame. The code is not very important, but what this does is this takes takes the list of targets, the list of target values, which is this, you know, this entire, then it creates a frequency table, initialized with zero. For each class, I'm going to count how many times that class occurs. Then I will iterate over the targets. And then for each of the classes, I will see. So let's say I have seven, one, two, zero. So I will, once I, when I'm processing this row, I will increase the count for seven, one, two, and zero. Right. And I just, yeah. The target values indicates the labels. So 7120 is basically, if you see the seventh element, which is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, endoplasmic reticulum, one is nuclear membrane, two is nucleoli, and nucleoplasm. Right. So it is saying that this set of images, the images with this ID, underscore red, underscore pink, etc. dot PNG, they have these labels, they have these classes present in them. Right. And now what we're trying to do is we're trying to count the frequencies of each of these classes. Right. So yeah, so you count all these frequencies. Then what I'm going to take the label names, the frequencies, I'm going to convert it into a percentage and then create a pandas data frame out of it. Okay. So as such, the code is not very important. The idea is that you run some processing and then you get back this frequency table. Okay. So now we know that the class zero nucleoplasm has a frequency. It occurs in 12,000 of the images. 41% of the images. So total number of images you can, if you want to know what is the total number of images, etc., you just do dot info, mm -hmm. just run dot info on the, on the data frame and you will get back. Like you, you have 31,000 images, right? 31,000 rows. Okay. So yeah, so now we have a slightly better understanding of our data that we have about, we have 28 classes and each of these classes, we have these many elements and we have these many this is the percentage and it's 10 lines of code, right? The next thing that you want my, uh, you can see here that uh, some, this class occurs in 41% of the data. This is 26, this is 12, 11, and then it drops quite steeply. Looks like many of these occur in just like 0.5 or even less than that, right? So in fact, 15 of the 28 classes have less than 3% of the samples, right? So any model that you build, now the kind of insight that you get from this is this, that any model that you build, which always predicts zero for these 15 classes, right? Will be 97% accurate. So if you are training, if you're training a model and you're getting 97% accuracy, that's probably not a very good result, right? It's, it can be deceptive. You can see, okay, I have 97%, but actually any model that just prints always returns that none of these classes are present is actually quite accurate by itself. Right. So this, you can use this to actually benchmark your model and uh, develop a baseline for what kind of a model uh, accuracy you should have. Okay. Now, if a good way to actually really visualize this would be to see a plot, there is a plotting library called matplotlib, which you can use, or you can simply use. So the data frame created by pandas already has a plot method. So you can specify what kind of a plot you want. Let's say I want a bar plot. I want a bar plot where the X axis is the name, the label name and the Y axis is the frequency. And I want to give this plot a title and I just run that. And you see here, you can get a nice plot of the data. Right. So with just one line of code, nothing extra done here. 
So this is not exactly histogram. This is a bar plot. Bar plot is simply showing something on the x. So the names on the x and the count on the y. We've already accumulated it, right? So histogram sort of works with the previous level of data, which it does the accumulation also. And plus you have bins, etc., in a histogram. So if you see this, you can see that there's a very steep drop. Probably you cannot really get an idea of how much these things are differing because all of these are about 2000, but beyond that, you can't really tell. So you might want to do in this kind of a case where you have a lot of imbalance, you might want to do a logarithmic plot. So just add, you just have to add this parameter log y equals. Then you get back a logarithmic plot. So here now the y scale is logarithmic. So this is 10, 100, 1000, and 10,000, right? And now you actually get a much nicer idea that below 100, there are these classes and between 100 to 1000, there are these and so on. Okay. So what I'm trying to get at here is that EDA exploratory data analysis is actually quite, most of these plots, most of these charts are just one or two lines of code and you should really try and figure out or try and figure out how to do it. The first thing is to ask questions. What are the questions you want to know about your data? And second thing is to just Google search on stack overflow on how to do it with pandas or matplotlib and then just do it before you build a single model. Okay. The next thing so far we are working with image data, but we've not seen any images. So let's try to take a look at some images. So this is one sample file inside the training folder. So there's an ID, there's an underscore, there's a color and then dot PNG. So in Python, there are a lot of libraries, a lot of ways of reading images. In, and the way we read images, is we parse the image and convert it into a NumPy array. So let's say it's a image with dimensions of 128 by 128 pixels and then three channels RGB. So you get back a 128 by 128 by three channel image, right? So that's just, uh, that's like a 3D array. In PyTorch, typically it's a reverse. You have the channels first. So you get back a three by 128 image. Either way, for now we use a simple uh, utility called image IO. Uh, you can pass it an image file and it will show you, it will return a NumPy array for the file. And if you want to show an image, there's a very simple function. All you have to do is import matplotlib.pyplot. So I'm importing it as PLT and uh, just call the function I am show. Okay. So PLT dot I am show, pass it the image. I'm also checking the shape here and you can also provide a title here. Okay. So there you go. This is the image. It is a 512 by 512 image. Where is the by three? It's not there because these are all grayscale images. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, you have four channels or four, four images for every training example. And each of these four are grayscale images. They have color coded them simply for action that this was a particular chemical, this was a different chemical and so on. So you have red, green, blue, yellow, which basically corresponds to four different chemicals. Okay. So if you want to see this, if you want to encode that color coding into this image, because we're going to look at a lot of grayscale images, or you can probably provide something called a C map, a color map, right? If you just say reds, and I'm plotting the same image. Now this is plotted as a red on white. Okay. And this this will be quite useful. We'll see so shortly. Of course, if you have normal RGB image, it just works. You don't need to pass anything, right? So if for a normal RGB image, you just pass the, you just read the image. You just pass the image into PLT to I am show. It shows you a nice colorful image. Okay. All right. So now for this particular file, for every file, we have four images, blue, green, red, and yellow. And each of these are single channel images, right? Now, what you might want to do for processing is, or for training your model is to load all of these into a single matrix, into a single three dimensional array, where instead of having like a 512 by 512 and then four of these, you can have a 512 by 512 by four matrix, right? Which is like four layers or four channels. So that's what I'm doing here. I have four channels, green, red, blue, and yellow. And to load an image, I pass an image ID. I provide the channels and this is just the directory. So for each of the channels, I read the image. Okay. And then I set it inside a array. So this array I have already initialized with zeros. It has four channels and 512 by 512, right? 
So I'm now I'm putting all the uh, all the images together. Now, once you have this, you can. So one one thing that a lot of people struggle with is plotting images in a because if you do PNT or I am sure it will just show this and then show something on the next line. But you might want to see things horizontally. So that is where there is a utility called subplots. So you can call matplotlib the plt dot subplots and just pass it the number of rows and the number of columns and a figure size if you wish. So this will give you an array of axes. And now instead of using plt to plot your images, you can actually just use the axis. So I'm using subax zero, subax one, subax two, and subax three. On each of these axes, I am plotting one of the images, right? So image zero, as we saw earlier, image zero would correspond to the green channel. Image one would correspond to the red channel. Image two would correspond to the blue channel. Image three to yellow, right? And that's why I have green, red, blue, and uh, this uh, orange here. Orange looks slightly better. Okay. Yeah, so this is just to get some labels, right? So let us try and plot something. So we take an ID, we load the image, we also construct a list of the labels, and then we just call the function show image filters, right? And just like that, you get a nice simple plot of four images in a row. You can plot many of these to get images in a grid. Okay. That's it. So these are the four channels, green, red, blue, and yellow. And so that's pretty much it about images. If you know these two or three things, one is how to read images, second is how to plot images in a grid. This makes your life much easier before. So the places where you want to look at your images are before you start training, just to understand the data. While you are training, if you have some examples where you are getting really bad results, this is always a good idea. Let's say you have a low validation set accuracy then probably go and check out some samples of, of data where the accuracy was really low, right? So that for that, you can probably use something like pandas, put all that information into, put all that data into pandas. So let's say I have trained DF, currently it contains all the information, but maybe I could actually filter out only the rows where I'm getting a really low accuracy, okay? Then I can pick a sample. I can pick a random sample of five images, 10 images out of this. And then uh, whichever is the ID row, you get that, right? And as you take all of these IDs and then simply plot them, and then you can look at this and you can understand, right? For instance, what I might understand here is I'm getting a really low accuracy because there is hardly anything visible on the green channel. And the green channel represents proteins in this competition, right? So this actually lets you know about the data that there is something missing in the data, that probably the data, this data is not good enough. So that is about images. The last thing that I want to talk about is now, let's say you have created a, a model. You have, you have been training your model for some time. You are happy with the accuracy. You want to see how it performs. You want to submit, you want to create a submission on Kaggle. So right now I'm using a very, a, a random model, a model that just outputs some random predictions. Okay. And in fact, this is actually a good idea to do when you're starting out, don't spend too much time on training your first model. First, get your pipeline together first get this like this kind of a notebook wherein you can very quickly do some eda do some analysis and then generate predictions and submit right and once you have this in place then you start training then you will find that iteration becomes a lot easier because as soon as you've trained you can then look at some examples you can see what's going well what's going bad right because these jobs tend to take like your training loop could take a few hours Right. So before you do that, you better make sure between the training loops that you have some information, you have learned something after each, after each iteration, after each training loop. Right. And that's why you need all of these functions, because if you don't have them, then you tend to get lazy. You think, okay, I'll change one hyperparameter and then I will just run it again. And then over days you keep running it and you don't really get a good improvement. Okay. Yeah. So I'm using a model that simply takes the inputs. I will pass it the IDs on which I want outputs and it will simply, I'm creating a random array. So it'll simply return a whole bunch of random probabilities. Okay. In fact, not even probabilities, but more like logics. So which is 
numbers in the range minus infinity to infinity, I then need to apply a sigmoid function to convert them into probabilities. Okay. So this is what the predictions look like currently. So I have minus, minus 0 0.8, minus 1, 0, 1, 2. So these vary from, these are like normally distributed about 0. Okay. Now to convert these to probabilities, I might have to then do a perform a sigmoid function on top of these. So performing sigmoid then does, brings them from like 0 to 1. So now I can treat these as probabilities. Then now to get the labels, to get the actual predictions, I have to look at each probability. So this is the prediction for the first training example, right? This is the prediction for the first image. And there are 28 probabilities here. Probability of each class occurring. Now I can do some kind of thresholding. I can say that maybe with a threshold of 0.5, if the probability is greater than 0.5, then this my image has that label, right? And if the probability is less than 0.5, my image doesn't have that label. So that's what I'm doing here. That for I in enumerate. So first I'm enumerating over this, the output, the predictions, the probabilities. I get the index and I, this is a class index and I get the probability predicted. If the probability is greater than a certain threshold, then I keep it. Okay. And then to this entire thing, I'm just applying the strain. Now you can actually simplify this. Okay. And uh, when I will join it, just, so you just pass a string, you, whatever separator you want dot join. And uh, yeah, that's it. Right. So what this does is this takes this kind of an array and this creates this string four, five, 10, seven, 19. So these are the predicted classes from your model, right? So similar, so this is very specific to this problem, but for every problem, you will have all of these steps. You get some predictions from their model. You do some processing, then maybe after you've done that processing, you probably want to put all of that into a data. So now I've, what I've done is I've combined the IDs for the images with the labels for the images and I created a data frame. So I have the ID and the predictions. You can actually, you can use a function called np.where and it will essentially do the same thing. Yeah. Okay. And once you have this prediction, it's you yeah. always pretty much always want to create a data frame out of it because the next step to submit to Kaggle is to actually create a CSV file. So now for the creating the CSV file, you can use a combination of like path lib to actually get the path of the file and uh, then just call to CSV in the pandas file, pass in the file name and probably check the top just to make sure that it looks good. Right? So these are some of the steps that you might have to do in some variation to create your own submission file right now as soon as you've done this for the first time oh and also you probably want to download the file let's say you're on a remote notebook and you want to submit so you can use file link to actually you can import file link from ipython.display just pass in the file name and it will give you a downloadable link to the file okay and just click on this the file will get downloaded now you can probably just go on kaggle submit Right. So if you have any kind of, if your structure is not fine, you will get an error here itself. If not, this will be successful. And then you can add a note. This is a random model. Okay. Yeah. So then you submit and uh, you see here now I got it. It'll give you the score and it'll tell you, this is actually, it says this is an improvement over my previous score. And which is surprising because I've spent three days training many models on this, this problem. And this is a kind of trap that we often fall into. I've spent three days. I've trained like I've trained a Keras model, a fast chain model, et cetera, et cetera. And what I realized at the end of this, once I do this EDA pipeline is that a random model is doing much better and you will find this all the time. Just look at this, right? All of these people, they're, they're about. 526 people, some of them have actually lower than the all zeros benchmark. So this is where you just predict that there is no class ever. Then there is another benchmark where you predict that all classes are always present.
Yeah, it's somewhere here, right? So even if you predict that all the classes are always present, you would still get an accuracy of 0.111, right? So these are the things that you probably want to look out for before you're spending weeks and weeks trying to improve a model which is giving you 0 0.0, 0 0.05 or whatever. Just try and submit a very basic model with some obvious predictions, like all zeros, all ones, random predictions, and see, use that as a baseline. If after your first few training epochs, you're not beating that, then you probably want to change your strategy. Maybe you want to use transfer learning. Maybe you want to try a different architecture. Maybe you want to do some data augmentation, right? So this saves you a lot of time. And the final thing is once you've done all of this, the most important thing is to take all of this code, all of this test submission code and just put it into a function, right? It's, it doesn't take a long time, but when you need it, this is actually quite useful. And just put it into a function. So you get the predictions, apply sigmoid, get the labels, create a data frame, save it to CSV. Okay, I did that twice. Yeah. Try the obvious things. Like in this case, the most obvious thing is start with a random prediction. Another obvious thing is try predict that no class is ever present. Predict that all the classes are always present. Or maybe see what is the most common class. For those classes, always predict one. For the classes which have less than 10%, always predict zero. And then you try all of these things. Also understand what the metric is, evaluation metric. You try all of these things and you already get a fair idea of what should be a starting accuracy for your model, right? It'll come from? It'll come from the EDA. It'll often, a lot of time it will come from the EDA. Like sometimes you could simply predict, let's say one sim very simple thing you could do another, probably a slightly better model is you look at this frequency table, right? And then you say that, okay, 41% of the images have nucleoplasm. So with a 0.4 probability, I will predict true. And then do that for each of these. And you might even end up with a good result that way. People have actually won competitions like this with just doing, just figuring out some insight about the data and just doing like a very simple heuristic. Okay. Yeah. So put all of this into a, put all of this into a function. And you can even put bash commands. You can even put terminal statements into a function. No problem. And now next time you need to create a submission, all you need to do is, okay. All you need to do is call make sub. You will get back the, it will generate the predictions. It will get the probabilities. It will save the file, show you a sample output so that you can make sure things are all looking fine and you can download the file. That's all I have. So these are the five things I wanted to cover, how to work with the file system, CSVs, EDA, images, and submissions.